Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. And we're just going to follow on with looking at some models for N and K. So uh, the aim here, because we could again spend all day looking at models for N and K, is just to give you a taste of what you can do with these models and why they might be useful to you. So I'd like to start by introducing this idea of a Lorentz oscillator. And the reason we're interested in Lorentz oscillator is I want you to at least appreciate why we have refractive index in the first place. And so there's a very sort of basic uh, piece of mathematics we can do which allows us to get some insight as to how light will behave when it propagates through anything that might absorb, uh, absorb light. So here I have, and I've lifted this straight out of Mark Fox's book, a nice uh, diagram just showing the displacement of an electron from the iron core, which is our sort of mental picture of what a, an electron dipole might look like. So you have an electron and it's being driven by an electromagnetic field, your light, and of course that's then the response of the material to that light. The details of what's going on may be very complicated. There may be electronic transitions and so on. Here we're just going to look at a completely classical model. So we're going to treat the electron as if it's just a charged particle and look at what the effect of light will be on this electron. So we can write down an equation of motion for this electron. And I want to just point out a few important things, uh, namely that obviously the electron is being driven by the electric field here. So that's on the right hand side of this equation. And then I've just got a, a sort of ordinary wave equation with a damping term. And the damping term is important. We're going, to, we're going to see that popping up in a few places. And that's this gamma term here. And that is what can describe at the very basic level the motion of our electron. Now if we carry on, and again I can refer you to Mark Fox's book for the details, but we can prove that there's a resonant frequency. A resonant frequency uh, that uh, takes place at some frequency, angular frequency at omega naught, and that that resonance, uh, this, this term that I've got here, has got the number of electrons, capital N, in it. Notice that it's uh, obviously frequency uh, frequency dependent, and that I've also got this gamma term uh, in there too. So this is, this is if, if you like, a solution to this uh, equation of motion, and it then allows us to write down what our relative permittivity might, would be, this epsilon r that we saw uh, in the previous section. So what we have is one plus and then some background and that background I'm just going to encapsulate into electric susceptibility. And then I've got uh, this term that's due to my Lorentz oscillator. And so again, I emphasize that we've got here this N, this number of electrons. So if I have just free space, nothing in it, no oscillators, N will be zero. And therefore, epsilon r is just whatever chi is, and if I've just got free space, then I just have the permittivity of free space. But as soon as I have a material with electrons in it, as I have oscillators, then I can, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to see what we would call some refractive index that isn't, that isn't unity. So we need, in this very simple picture, the presence of electrons in order to, to have a non-unity refractive index. And so this answers, perhaps one reason I'm showing you this, is this answers one of the uh, most confusing questions that you can ask any physics uh, undergraduate student is, what is the origin of the refractive index? I mean, most students are very familiar with the idea of refractive index. We saw you're introduced to it from Snell's law. But this is therefore the origin of our, of our refractive index, is the presence of little electron dipoles, or at least this is a model which justifies that. So we see that we have 
a, a term here that depends on n, the number of electrons. It's got our damping term gamma in it. Uh, it's got some uh, resonant frequency, omega naught. And notice that on the numerator here, we've got unity. Now, when, it, when we come to fit uh, the optical response of materials, we'll find that we need to ascribe some kind of strength to our oscillator. So in the different models, I'm going to show you one for gallimard Snide in a minute. Uh, Ivan's going to show you other, other models uh, which you might want to use if you're fitting ellipsometry data. But this expression here we have for the relative permittivity is being der derived classically. In other words, it's simply the response of free electrons to incident electromagnetic radiation. There's no quantum mechanics here. So in order to encapsulate optical transitions between electronic states, we have to modify this, and we do that generally by replacing this one with some kind of oscillator strength, some kind of transition strength. So that's one mod mod modification that you're going to see here. And the other, of course, which we're going to use as a fitting parameter is this uh, gamma, which is a sort of broadening parameter. Now, before we get on to that, I just want to show you the consequences of just this simple classical Lorentz oscillator. And uh, what I'm plotting here is just the real and imaginary components of this relative permittivity. Uh, for a Lorentz oscillator with, with some configuration, you, you can see what the, uh, what the particular numbers that were used to generate this on the graph. And so what, what we see is that for epsilon 2, the imaginary co component, we get this strong resonance at, uh, at the omega naught frequency, and that it rapidly dies away either side. Whereas uh, ep uh, epsilon 1 here goes through this sort of wiggle or this, this, this in inflection. It has this Lorentzian line shape. Of course, we can transform this into uh, n and k, we saw earlier that if we know epsilon 1, epsilon 2, then we also know n and k. These, these, these uh, values are interchangeable. One of the motivations for plotting your data in terms of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 is the parameters that are likely to be important to you will drop out much more naturally. So notice that this uh, epsilon 2 line shape here has is defined, in a sense, by gamma. The width is defined by gamma, and it's centered on omega naught, whereas by the time we've transformed this into k, then uh, although it looks similar, it's, of course, diff different. So we get a little bit l less physical insight into the properties of the oscillator if we're talking about n and k than epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. I should also mention that I only need to know one. If I'm performing a, a measurement here, I could measure n or I could measure k. And if I make a very good measurement of that, I can use the properties of wave prop propagation, with these kramers kronig relations, to transform one to the other. So I show you this not to bamboozle you with mathematics, but to say that if I've made a measurement of absorption, for example, here, k, on the left-hand side, I can, in principle, transform that and get an indication of n. Now, what are the issues with this? Let's just look at the uh, in, in, integral that we're going to have to perform here. So we, we want to know what n is, and we only know what k is. Well, the, here we have k, our extinction coefficient, and uh, the integral looks fair enough. We just do an integral with angular frequency here from r, minus infinity to plus infinity. That means that in principle we need to know what k is over the entire frequency spectrum. Now it may well be that we know that, or we can approximate that, but this is one of, one of the limitations we have uh, in terms of transforming between n and k is that we, we would need to make some assumption as to what was happening with, to, uh, to k in this case outside of the range of measurement. Mathematically, I could write down some expression for k and I can very conveniently transform it to give me n. And that's in actually some, something which is done routinely for the functions that 
we're going to use in a minute to look at transitions in semiconductor materials. But in terms of treating experimental data, of course you're limited into some bandwidths here, and then that can cause is issues when you perform this transformation. But perhaps to recap, we've already s stated that N and K and Epsilon 1 and Epsilon 2 are uh, encapsulating the same thing. They're interchangeable. The kramers kronig relations it, it tell us that actually if we only know one of these, then at least in principle we can uh, get some insight on the other. So now I'd like to take you and show you a practical example. And so I'm going to choose again gallium arsenide. And here is the absorption coefficient of gallium arsenide. It's plotted as a function of photon energy on the x-axis, and I've got a log scale here for the absorption coefficient. And conveniently, the author of the paper that I've taken this from has decorated it with certain important features. Now, if I were to perform a complicated band structure calculation, I would end up with some dispersion curve for gallium arsenide that would look something like this. And so it can take you a little bit of time, if you're not familiar with this type of diagram, to sort of pick out the bits you're, you're familiar with. Energy zero here is defined at the top of the valence band. Okay, so, so, so what we see here are light and heavy hole states, and just below it is the spin orbit band. Here's the conduction band. So because this is plotted in a sort of extended zone scheme, you, you see that you've got uh, uh, this picture we have of sort of parabolic bands is of course only true close to the zone centre, but it's, uh, it's good enough for many, many purposes. So the interesting thing now is if we start putting on this diagram the transitions of interest. So here's the band gap, E0. This is the one parameter which you're most familiar with is the band gap energy. So here we call that E0. We also uh, might have some indirect band gaps. So of course you're very familiar that silicon has an indirect band gap. So in the case of silicon, your, these indirect band gaps would be extremely impor important. For gallium arsenide, they're not so important. We notice just on this absorption coefficient that the first indirect band gap comes in just a little bit above the band gap energy here. It doesn't make a great deal of difference to the optical properties of ga gallium arsenide, but we do include it in the model. Then we have a, a possible transition from the spin orbit split off band here to the conduction band, which is this E0 plus delta naught. Delta naught being the splitting between uh, the spin orbit band and the valence band. Then we can have E1, and E1 is usually at a much higher energy. That's the direct transition here at the L point. And then I can have E2, which is here at the X point, another direct transition. And so you notice that the author of this paper has conveniently uh, indicated where they think these, these uh, transitions might be. Or actually, more to the point, what I'm showing you is, of course, experimental data, which is these black dots, and underneath is a model for the optical constants or op optical functions of gallium arsenide. So each one of these little energies is, in a sense, an oscillator. It's a little bit more complicated than the Lorentz oscillator, so let's just go back to the Lorentz oscillator. The Lorentz oscillator, we had a, a particular frequency for the oscillator. What we're effectively doing is replacing that frequency with an energy. And what we're also about to do is to sort of see, here's our broadening term, and there's going to be some strength term which is going to replace the numerator. So here are the actual fitting parameters that are used to, for, for, for gallium arsenide. Uh, there's a lot of detail here, but uh, evidently you have to specify what your E0 is, that's your band gap, then your E0 plus delta naught, that's this spin orbit band, and then you can add more and more and more bands. You've got E1 and uh, here's the indirect one and so on. Here are all the various strength parameters, A, B, C, and D, and then there's various broadening parameters that, 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 that are used, for example, gamma. And then finally, there's a sort of what 
what in the paper they call a non-dispersive background, but this is just sort of your, your static uh, permittivity. When this is transformed in, into N and K, this is now what N and K look like. So you've seen this before. I've shown you N and K for gallium arsenide uh, before lunch, but now the fun thing is, is we can decorate this with these, uh, with these uh, different transitions, and more to the point, we've got a model now here which is just a sum of oscillator functions which can reproduce the data rather nicely. So you can see, and you, if you cast your mind back to uh, you know, an hour or two before lunch, the band gap of gallium arsenide sits, sits here, 1.42. Here's E0. And we see that the refractive index of gallium arsenide, N, is already at something like 3.2. Then we noticed before lunch that N strongly peaks at one point. Well, that one point corresponds to the E1 transition, which is extremely strong. And in terms of the absorption coefficient, if we just flip back to the absorption coefficient, notice that there's a really sharp climb in the absorption coefficient as we get to E1. This is a log scale here, so, so these, the strength of these tran transitions is really relatively weak in comparison to what's happening at E1. And then again at E2. And these, these sort of oscillators, if, if you like, are really strongly observed in the refractive index here in N. Of course, you also see them here in K. So this is an example of a model which you can fit to your data and Yvonne's going to take you through how we measure n and k and some of the functions that, that, we, can, that, that we can ascribe uh, to, to describe n and k. In my own research I've I found this type of model where you can take the dielectric functions n and k and then link that to band structure to be very useful. <coughs> And so I'd like to show you one example just before I hand over uh, to, to Ivan. So one of the materials that we're interested in, I, as you know I work in high, high efficiency multi-junction solar cells, is gallium arsenide bismide. Now if you add a very small amount of bismuth into gallium arsenide, the band gap drops dramatically. That's what's being shown on this graph here. So that on the x-axis we have fraction of bismuth, y-axis we have uh, band gap energy, and by adding only a few percent of bismuth, you can reduce the band gap quite dramatically. Technologically, what we would like to do is make a one electron volt alloy, and you can see that with bismuth we can get there with only about four percent bismuth. So that's, uh, that's the motivation for this, and if you were to make uh, these gallium arsenide bis bismide alloys, the it's a relatively unstudied semiconductor, so you can grow something, but then you aren't sure whether what you've grown is right, and you're not sure what the absorption coefficient is, you're not sure about many things. So here we have just absorption coefficient data. The, these are the data points, and for different bismuth fractions. So uh, we have purple here is gallium arsenide, and then we go up to some amount of bismuth, 9.7% of bismuth here in yellow. And what we wanted to do was to find some kind of model, some kind of parameterization, which would mean that we weren't just stuck with the few measurements that we had of the absorption coefficient of gallium arsenide bismide. What you'd like to be able to say is, OK, here I have uh, maybe sort of 4% bismuth, and my next measurement point 6% bismuth. What about 5%? And so you might think, well, yes, that's tricky, because my absorption coefficient probably has a lot of complicated features in it. If it looks anything like gallium arsenide, how do you interpolate between gallium arsenide and gallium arsenide? And, you know, so you add some bismuth to, to this, all these, all these peaks will shift. Well, how do they shift? Well, the nice thing is, is if you've made one of these uh, oscillator models, so this particular one that I'm using here is a critical point parabolic band model, then you can, uh, make little functions that say, okay, well, E naught is just like 
you're familiar with, with uh, band gap versus composition, you can say, okay, I'm just going to have a linear interpolation between values that I know for E0, for sort of gallium arsenide, 2% gallium arsenide, bismide, uh, 4% and, and so on. So you, you, if you were to fit these functions at the various points where you have data, then of course you can interpolate between those parameters. And that's going to give you a pretty good fix of what the optical properties of alloys that you've never grown are going to be. So you could imagine that's particularly useful if you've got a situation like we had with a completely unknown, uh, completely unknown uh, semiconductor alloy. If you were to imagine adding a fourth element to this, so you now have a quaternary alloy, then the chances that somebody has measured the absorption coefficient for every single comp no possible composition is zero. So in that, in that case, it's very useful if a few researchers have measured a few points, we get an idea of what the critical point energies are effectively related to the band structure, and then we can interpolate between those. And we can predict to some extent what the absorption coefficient might be, for example, for alloys that we've never grown. So in this particular case, just to sort of close this story, this is some work that my student Tom Wilson did and he presented at the European Photovoltaics Conference. So you might notice that as you go from gallium arsenide to add gallium arsenide bismide, there seems to be a sort of broadening taking place here in the tail. And if you look at Tom's fitting, this G parameter here is the broadening. And you notice that gallium arsenide has a broadening of 12, but by the time we get to 5.5 gallium arsenide bismide, we've had to broaden it quite significantly. It goes up to 75 here. And that's due to disorder. It's due to sort of bismuth. Uh, uh, not being incorporated in a, in a smooth way. And so that manifests itself in the broadening of the absorption coefficient. We were interested in what effect this would have on the voltage of gallium arsenide bismide solar cells, and that's what Tom's work was all about. Anyhow, that's all I have to say about models for N and K. So now I'll hand over to Ivan, who will talk to you about how we actually determine N and K in the first place. Mm -hmm.